Okay, so I'm going to tell you about Stan.jl. This is our core development team. I'm Bob Carpenter. Rob Goodman is the one who actually wrote the uh, interface to Julia. So what is Stan? Stan's an imperative probabilistic programming language. So if you look at something like Sigma.jl, which is the probabilistic programming language, it's Julian. It's actually expressed in Julia. Um, Bugs is something like this that's declarative in terms of declaring a graphical model. There's Church and all of its descendants, which started here in our functional programming languages. Figaro is an object-oriented one. A Stan program simply declares data and constrained parameter values. And the purpose of it is to define the log posterior. And I'll give you an example in a second. And currently, we support three different kinds of inference. We support uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo for full Bayesian inference. We support approximate Bayesian inference through black box variational Bayes. And we do optimization for penalized maximum likelihood. So why do you want to use Stan? Um, for efficient full Bayes, basically, the reason we built this project is because we had a lot of problems that we couldn't actually solve in any of the existing tools. And I think as of now, there's many kinds of models where Stan is really the only thing out there other than writing your own super custom thing that's actually going to solve the model for you. Um, in particular, we deal with a lot of constrained parameters in our models, like correlation matrices or simplices. We do a lot of multi-level generalized um, linear modeling with interacted predictors and a lot of hierarchical structure, the kind of thing Doug Bates was talking about before. We're actually working on exactly that same problem. We have a very extensive multivariate um, support. We have differential equation solvers built in, which we've applied to things like PKPD models and soil carbon respiration. Um, and it's an easily extensible general language that's portable across platforms right now. The underlying thing is written in C++. Um, but right now it runs on all the different platforms. We have interfaces for R and Python and MATLAB and Stata now even in Julia. Um, we also have a really cool um, posterior visualization and exploration tool called Shiny Stan, which is probably something you could borrow in Julia and implement for yourselves because it's written in Shiny, which is very much like Escher. Um, who's using Stan? Right now we have around 1,200 uh, members on our users group. We have around 10,000 manual downloads for each of our releases. These are areas where people have actually published papers, scientific papers, using Stan to do their probabilistic inference. So we're working sort of across the biological, physical, and social sciences, as well as some engineering, finance, actuarial stuff, sports, public health. Um, so let me give you, I've only got 10 minutes, so I've got to go fast. So the, here's an example of Stan. This is code written in Stan's domain-specific language. Um, and this is for a simple model where the data is independent, identically distributed Bernoulli variables. So you can see that it does what I said earlier. It declares a data block, a parameters block, and then a model block to define the density. So, and the variables come with constraints. Here they're just simple lower and upper bound constraints, but in general you could declare a variable to be a covariance matrix, for instance. All of our parameters wind up getting transformed from the constraints back into an unconstrained space. So we do, we log transform positive parameters, we logit transform parameters constrained to zero, one, we Cholesky factor and log transform the diagonals for covariance matrices. So all of our actual work is done in an unconstrained space, but the user works everything in the constrained domain. So you'll see that the parameter for this model is theta, which is the probability of getting a one for one of the data points. And that's constrained to have a lower bound of zero and an upper bound of one. The data is in, Bernou in binary observations, so we have n observations. Each one's an integer between zero and one. The model is basically giving you a prior and likelihood. This is like the simplest possible kind of model you could write. Um, it's saying that theta has a uniform distribution, which is the prior. And the likelihood function is a vectorized form here, which says the members of Y have a Bernoulli distribution with parameter theta, right? So this model goes to define that density that I wrote out in more mathematical notation on the bottom. So the point of Stan is you declare the data, you declare the parameters with their constraints, and then you declare the model, and that together defines a density function for you. Right, what does Stan.jl do? Right, well, it supports data and input and output from Julia. 
right? It supports posterior analysis and visualization using the Mamba.jl library. Currently, it's implemented by a very simple remote process call. So Stan's running over in its own process. This is just calling it, right? In the future, it would be possible, I was just talking to Alan about this before we stepped in, um, we could build something like a graphical modeling language or some other representation for Stan inside of Julia. So if you compare something like PyMC3, that's a Python package that does a lot of the same kinds of things that Stan does, but it has a Python definition, a language of data structures within Python for defining a limited set of the kind of models that we could do, but it gives you a way of metaprogramming those models inside of something like Python. Um, it would also be possible to write an in-process C++ interface. That's what we've done for RStan and PyStan. Um, but right now, it's just doing a simple remote process call. Um, there's also within Julia competition for this. So Laura.jl is part of the stats package or group or whatever you call it. Um, and that's promising to do MCMC with NUT. So the no U-turn sampler is what we actually used for Markov chain Monte Carlo. And then there's the sigma.jl um, that we heard about yesterday, um, which is actually a completely in Julia probabilistic programming system. So now I'm gonna just step through the example of how, I, I didn't have enough nerve to actually do this live, so it's, it's canned on the slides, but I just did it this morning, so I know it works. Um, this is just comes out of the stand.jl GitHub page, so you can follow along and do this example yourself. So it uses these three libraries, and then it defines the model actually as just a string inside the language. Um, then what you do is you actually build the model um, out of, you give it a name, and Bernoulli stand model is the string, and you can display it, which shows all the various configuration, and there's a lot of control you have here. This is just defaults for everything all the way down. Um, then you're defining data, and the data comes in the form of a Julia dictionary. So that defines the variable n and the variable y. These are basically the data block members all get defined in that dictionary. Um, then you actually run stan by calling the function stan, and that passes in this stan model, passes in the data, Bernoulli data, which is that array of dictionaries, and the project directory is just a scratch working directory there. Then you can actually grab the simulations that come out of the MCMC um, by running STAN itself. And then the description of that looks like this. So you pull the simulation objects out of Mamba and the description looks like this. So what we get is we get, and this is a bit trimmed down. The, the output's actually a bit more verbose than this. Um, this is giving us the log density value and the value of theta and it's just telling us what the posterior mean is what the Monte Carlo standard error is in estimating that mean, what the posterior standard deviation is, giving you some quantiles, and then the important thing is we're giving you the number of effective samples. So there's a central limit theorem for MCMC that basically says your Monte Carlo standard error in estimating the mean is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of effective samples you have. So the point of doing something like MCMC is you want a sampler that mixes very well, that gives you a very high and effective rate for the number of iterations, really for the number of times you're running. And then the last column is just a convergence diagnostic. If that values anything other than very close to one, it's indicating that your Markov chains have not converged to their stationary distribution. Right? And all this stuff can be pulled out programmatically as well. You can actually pull out the chains and plot them and anything else you want to do for downstream inference with this. You can also do downstream posterior predictive inference within STAN, but I don't really have time to, to show you all of that. And then this is the, the rather verbose code for actually pulling out and plotting the output in a browser. Um, so the first thing just does the actual plotting, and then there's a draw that produces an SVG file, and then that's push to the browser that's set as a default here. But what that looks like is actually this, right? So what you're doing is you're getting a plot of each of the different chains here. So the parameter is the thing on the bottom. So it's showing that the Markov chains are mixing very well from that trace plot on the left. It's showing that you're converging. That, that second column of plots you probably don't need. 
Um, the third column is giving you the actual posterior density estimate. So those are just simple curve fitting, um, non-parametric posterior. I don't know exactly what Rob did to fit that, but that's basically giving you an estimate of what the posterior distribution likes. And, and Alan again asked me to really emphasize the fact that when you're doing something like a Bayesian model like this, even though it looks like here, the point of this is to produce an estimate for theta like 0.333, by the way, that's the right answer for the posterior mean. It should not be 0 0.30, even though there's three out of 10, because the posterior mean is not equal to the posterior mode in a beta distribution. And we can do this model analytically and show that that's actually the right result, because the posterior is skewed, so the mean and the mode are not exactly at the same place. But the point of Bayesian inference is not to calculate these estimates like the posterior mean, but to rather take the uncertainty that you have in a parameter Right, so this is this la the third column of the last row here is telling you that we're really pretty uncertain about what the value is. I've got to actually look at this. It's somewhere between zero and 0.75 is like the span of that. So with only 10 observations, there's a lot of posterior uncertainty. So if we wanted to use this model to say, we did 10 observations, we got this estimate, see what's coming next, then what we will do is we do a weighted average over that posterior, right? So we weight it by the posterior density, basically by doing the integral, which can all be done within STAN. And that was my last slide. So. Yes. Um, right now, we don't do anything with posterior, with multimodal things. So you're going to have a problem in just about any MCMC technique and any optimization technique with multimodal stuff. There are some solutions that we're working on. We have, uh, we have a really great physicist we're working with, Michael Betancourt, who's archived a paper on an adiabatic sampler, which generalizes. So we're doing a lot of very physical analogies with the way our sampler actually works. And the adiabatic sampler actually generalizes parallel tempering with a proper heat bath model, which will let you find a limited number of modes. So if you have a posterior that has a couple modes in it, or 10 you might be able to find it, nothing's going to solve this hugely combinatorial posterior mode problem, though. Right, the technology is just not there. And also, all the technology to do multimodal stuff is very sketchy and, and preliminary, not just in us, but like across the entire field, both for optimization and for sampling. So. I'm sad to say we have not cracked that problem.